Well, thanks everybody for coming this morning. Uh, what I'm going to do is walk you through sort of an overview of the big data space, what's going on, what's important to you, and I'm going to cover four uh, primary areas. So I'll start with some of the trends in the market that we're seeing today. I'll put some of that in perspective in terms of how you would take those trends and make use of them in your organization. We'll actually talk about some of the people and organizational uh, characteristics that you have to think about. And then we'll finish with some thoughts on putting big data to work, meaning how do you take all of that and actually uh, achieve results at, at your company. So one of the first things I always like to start out with is a very common thing, which is, you know, people always want to know what's the definition of big data. And I get asked this question over and over. I'm sure all of you have had debates. And I recall very specifically a LinkedIn conversation. And if you ever use LinkedIn much, you know that a typical posting on LinkedIn, if you get two or maybe three uh, comments on a given topic, that's pretty good. Most don't get any. This thing got into the dozens. I swear it might have broken a uh, hundred. And it was all about what's the definition. And everybody was coming up with one more nuance to what is or isn't uh, big data. And that's sort of when it hit me that we had gone above and beyond meaningful conversation and into just sort of purely academic speculation that wouldn't help in practice. So my definition that I like to stick to is two words, very simple, who cares? Okay. And let me explain why. It's not that big data is not important. It's that what really counts is the results you're going to get with big data. The definition of it really doesn't matter so much. And I'll go, I'll go a step further as well, which is the process you should always be following is I have a problem I need to solve. What data is available that could help me solve it? Given that you find a new data source that could help, you need to figure out how to acquire and implement that data for that analysis process. That's true whether the data is big, small, or otherwise. So even if we could agree a data source is big or not, it's irrelevant to you until such time as you need it. And at the same time, once you need it, regardless of how we've defined it, you're going to have to figure out how to do something with it. So really, at the end of the day, I think you shouldn't worry so much about defining big data as about just seeking out all the data sources that you can that you believe add distinct value. And so another thing is starting from the right perspective. And I'm going to tell you a little theme here that is going to sound painfully obvious, and you'll sort of wonder why you're wasting my time with this obvious theme. But then I will explain why I'm wasting your time. So you've got to start with not data and hope you find a business problem to solve it. And this is what a lot of large companies are doing today. They're just investing massively in a, quote, big data project, which has nothing to do with analytics or use of data. It's all focused just purely on let's grab it as fast as we can, rather than, again, what we should have been doing all along, finding a problem and let that lead us to the data. So why would I state this obvious thing that we've all known for 20 years? Well, the reason is because many very large and disciplined companies have been forgetting this very basic theme. And I was very puzzled by this for a while, and I think I have figured out why. And this is probably true in almost everybody here uh, today in your organization. Today, every board of directors is more or less asking every CEO, what are you doing with big data? And the CEO is then asking the CIO and the CMO and everyone else, what are you doing with big data? They ask the people down the chain, what are you doing with big data? The most not acceptable answer is nothing. Or even the, we're doing a very disciplined approach to figuring out how to do it right so we can actually drive some value. It's just going to take us a couple of quarters. That doesn't cut it. What everyone's saying is, I'm on it. And what on it means is, you know, shooting first, aiming later. And there have already been some somewhat reasonably high profile uh, disasters with this approach. And when I say reasonably high, it's because I'm aware of some that have been fairly high uh, level of disaster, but they keep it very quiet, right? And if they would just flip it around to the usual process of understanding what you're going after first. So I, if I challenge you to think about those people who say, yes, I'm on it this year, get through that conversation very nicely. And now they're a hero right now because everyone up the chain says, we're on big data. But about a year, 18 months from now, then the same people will come back and say, now you've spent all this money. What do you have to show for it? And if your answer is, well, that's what we're trying to figure out now, I would not want to be that, uh, that person. Which leads to another question that comes up is whether there's a bubble in big data. So I got asked this initially uh, after Gartner Group, uh, I think it was January of a year ago, came out with a hype cycle report and it showed big data at, uh, going over the peak and heading down to the trough of disillusionment. And a reporter called me, I don't know, uh, maybe a week after that report, two weeks, and said, what do you think? Is there this, you know, is big data heading for a big fall? And I, I told that reporter what I'll tell you, which is, yes, in some ways there is, and I'll explain, but more importantly, no. In other ways, there is not a bubble. 
So there is a bubble to the extent of what I just sort of talked about. People are thinking it's just going to be too fast, too cheap, too easy. There's going to be some magic button that solves big data. And then again, I come back. When has analytics and driving value from data ever been as easy as slap some data in a storage environment and hit some easy button and you have an answer? It's never been that easy. Why is it going to be that easy with big data? It actually puzzles me how people would think that. So to the degree that we get through that and people start to say, you know, this is actually going to just take some time, it's going to take some effort, we're going about it sanely, I think it's a very good thing. We want that bubble to burst. But let's think about how there's not a bubble, and I'll take you back to the Internet. In 99 and 2000, there was a huge Internet bubble, as I'm sure everyone in the room is aware. And you can go back and find individuals and companies that went belly up uh, and, and just had a disaster of a time during that bubble. Go read the articles, however, about how the Internet was going to change our lives personally and the business uh, that we participate in. And I think you'll find that today the Internet has added vastly more impact to us as individuals and the business world as well as the, 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 the globe as a whole than even the wildest claims in 99 and 2000. So it's not that even that bubble was about the Internet being bogus or not having all the potential and more. It was about people thinking it'd be too cheap, too easy, too fast. So my blog, I think, last month, was on the theme of this where just as in, in 99, any company with an I or an E in its name would get somewhat instant funding if you could tie yourself to the Internet. If today I went to a venture capital while I was here and uh, firm and I started talking about I have a cloud-based, in-memory, machine learning, big data, analytics as a service company. Okay, I said that with a straight face, you noticed. That just m took it from $2 million to $5 million worth of uh, investment. So I think that's exactly where we are with big data. It's a little bit hyped. But at the end of the day, it has so much potential that we will absolutely achieve everything we've heard about so far, and I believe a lot more in the next five or ten years. You just have to, as usual, be patient and work hard to make it happen. Let's just talk about some ways that big data is starting to change things. Here's a, a map of uh, Disney World down in uh, Florida. And for many years, Disney has done extensive research on their guests and their guest behavior and how to make it a better experience. They're you know, one of the best at this. They've recently rolled out these new things called a magic band, which is effectively just an RFID tag in a bracelet that serves as your ticket. Uh, you can buy things at the restaurants and stores. You can get your fast passes. It makes a, a, a more seamless experience for the guest. At the same time, what it does is give Disney a massive level of new data on what people are doing in their park. And there's two aspects to this that, that become important. One is they've studied crowds for many years, but a crowd in that case was sort of a blob, right? It was this blob that was a little more concentrated here at 9, a little more concentrated there at 10, but it was all about a crowd as, as a blob or a set of blobs. With these magic bands now, they had the ability to go in and look at the individual people who make up that blob. How many people, for example, go as many rides as they can and only take a break when they're really tired? How many take a ride or two, take a break, take a ride or two, take a break? As you start to understand what people are doing, they start to be able to incentivize people to either buy something more when they are taking a break or, or uh, uh, otherwise leverage those patterns. But the other thing is when you think about their, one of their core premises is the children who get to meet the characters. So historically, a character would have come up and said hello, and the, the princess would have thrilled the little girl uh, and been a highlight of a trip. Well, with the magic band, if you enable it, uh, and we'll talk about privacy in a little bit, but if you were to enable it, you can actually enter things like, we're here from Atlanta for my daughter Danielle's seventh birthday, and you know she loves gummy bears. And when the princess is walking up and she has her handlers, as they always have around, they could have a they, they can have a device now that will sense that uh, magic band. The information pops on the screen. They whisper it in the princess's ear. And now the princess, instead of just saying hi, can come up and actually say, hey, Danielle, happy birthday. We're so glad you're here. And if you walk to the little store over there and tell them that I sent you, they'll give you a free bag of gummy bears for your birthday. It takes the power of that experience up just an order of magnitude. And then we could get into how it even changes uh, the way people work. So one of my favorite examples is a, a friend of mine who works for a large logistics organization. And for many years, they would optimize what each driver would have uh, on their truck for delivery. And it was very effective. But when the person uh, actually was given their truck for the day, it was up to them to then make the deliveries happen. So they optimized up to a point and left it up to the, the humans to another point. You can imagine a bit of the resistance from 20, 25-year tenure drivers who are very good at what they do 
when a guy like me in a suit shows up and says, I've run some algorithms, here's now how you must drive your truck today, right? It's not a popular concept with truck drivers. So luckily this organization realized that, and this gets to some of the cultural things you have to think about. Instead of saying, our nerdy analysts at headquarters have said you must do this, they made it a whole game. And they said, can you beat the computer? And he told me the story of one driver that was very good, had been around for years, and he, he was averaging 150 miles a day. So they said, our computer thinks you can do it in 140. What do you think? And he goes, oh, the computer, you know, that's just stupid. I'm going to go out and prove you guys wrong. And he gets 135 after a couple weeks. So they look at what he did and how he deviated, and they come back and say, all right, the computer thinks you can get 130. What do you think? He goes, oh, the computer doesn't know anything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. And he goes out, he gets down to 125. So you got to understand that one driver per mile per day equates to $30 million uh, a year or more. And that was one driver getting down 25 miles a day. But the beauty of this is that driver still thinks the analytics are stupid and don't, and don't help and don't have any impact at all. That's okay with the organization because it's not about making every line employee you have understand and appreciate data and analytics. It's about getting them to change their behavior. And this is a great example of getting those employees to change their behavior even while they had zero appreciation or recognition that the analytics had done so. That's okay. You have to be careful to manage the level at which you're expecting people to really understand versus simply act. So another trend that's been coming on very strong is the idea of industry classifications getting blurred with all of the technology and data possibilities today. And so I've, I've never had the chance to do this yet, but I would love to have been able to survey the whole room prior to the show to find out and ask a simple question like, what does Nike do? And the vast majority of people, probably well over 95 or 99% on, uh, on the street and even in this room would say something along the lines of a clothing manufacturer, sportswear, or some combination thereof. And that is not inaccurate, but it's not complete anymore. So one of their most popular products is this thing called a uh, fuel band. I have a competitive product on my wrist now. Who has one of these on their wrist today? Something like it. Okay, relatively small number in here, actually. Uh, it's funny, they can fluctuate from 70% in some audiences down to, in Europe, actually, I was in a meeting where no one had one on. I guess they haven't caught on in Europe as much. Um, and one company, it was a little unfair because it was a large organization, and they got one for free if they would wear it they would get $100 or $200 off their insurance premium. So everybody had one on there. Um, but that's not quite the same. The point is, this is a high-tech electronics device with sensors and transmitters. Now, Nike recently said they might get out of ma actually manufacturing them, but as of today, they're in the high-tech manufacturing business. The first thing you do when you buy these is you go and download software. So on my phone right now, I have software that interacts uh, through Bluetooth to download all of the information off of this device, so Nike's now creating software. That data has to go somewhere, so now Nike's set up uh, you know, st uh, systems for storage out there somewhere that they're actually uploading the data. data. They're now in the uh, storage business. More importantly, the only reason we do any of that is so we can get analytics on activity and sleep patterns and so forth. So now Nike's in analytics as a service. And this starts to bleed into healthcare a little bit, right, if you can begin to correlate these things. So the point is simply that it's not untrue that Nike's in sportswear and clothing, but this new product requires a lot of skills as an organization that have nothing to do with traditional clothing. It's not about how good it looks, because I can promise you, that when I'm in short sleeve even, I'm not the most fashionable guy, and I'm a little embarrassed at how, how nerdy this thing looks on my wrist, right? It's not exactly fashionable. When you buy a shoe, it's about performance. This isn't really about performance either. It's about analytics. So you've got to be hiring people who know how to design the electronics, how to know how to do software, know how to store and manage that data. Nothing to do with their traditional business model. It's a big transformation. But the most important point is that the consumers are not buying by the same criteria. It's not about how fashionable it looks is not why I buy it, or whether it's a high-performing uh, rubber band. It's about the analytics that I get. My entire decision point when I bought the one I have was on research on the analytics. The device was secondary. And this is huge because we're seeing this across the board. Everything from tractors to automobiles is starting to have sensors and data and therefore analytics embedded in them. And people are now making decisions on what used to be a stodgy old commodity product based on the analytics that it provides. And this is a big change. And you need to think in your organizations, where are there opportunities for you to differentiate yourself, not with another product feature in the traditional sense, but with an analytic or data feature that would provide value to your uh, customers.
And then last, gets into that, monetizing. There are so many opportunities these days where we see large organizations now turning data. You know, we've talked about it being an asset historically, but what that really meant for the most part was a company would have it as an asset they could use to either run more efficiently or get extra lift on their direct marketing or otherwise have internally focused analytics that improve how they did business internally. What, what organizations are doing now is actually turning that around and saying, wait, this data is truly an asset. We have data and or analytics on the data that we can sell for a revenue stream. So traffic apps, when you look, uh, like today, there was an accident apparently going north from here on the interstate because there was a huge red, uh, a huge red line. Well, there's multiple ways to get that, one of which is GPS providers or cell phone providers who know where, where their millions of customers are can give that information to the map provider. Automobile manufacturers are now collecting this information. They're looking for ways to bundle it. Again, privacy protected in aggregate levels. Uh, and I'll give you one more example would be, let's assume I want to open a restaurant. And I've got that restaurant down to three locations that from your classic site selection basis are almost identical, right? The same geodemographic profile. They're both in a strip mall within a quarter mile of each other. A phone company, for example, though, could come back and tell me, you know, Bill, we can tell you exactly how many people actually drive by that storefront or walk by that storefront every day out of our subscriber base. We can give you the typical income profile, the typical uh, uh, profile of uh, a variety of other things that the phone company has on their own as well as from overlaying data, information I otherwise wouldn't have, where I might realize that these three sites that looked equivalent, one of them is actually far better based on the people who actually go past it rather than just the general neighborhood profile. So this is another huge trend that you need to look for in your organization around how do you take your data and analytics and make it external. Two of the companies on the forefront of this were you know, some local companies here like you know, a Netflix, uh, for example, where the recommendation engine is a very public product that they tout to the public as something that's a differentiator directly. So with that background, I want to go into a little bit about some perspective on this. So one interesting thing, there's been this debate, and I've seen a variety of claims that somehow now with big data, we have so much information, judgment's taken out of the mix, right? And, and now the data will just tell us the answer. There's a couple problems with that. So first of all, you know, there's the classic correlation is not causation. A lot of folks have been mistaken. Just because you find a correlation in big data, that does not mean cause and effect. And I go back to my Stats 101 class uh, in graduate school. Actually, that would have been in, in undergraduate school even. It's so simple. Where, for example, in basketball, one of the highest correlations you'll find is between scoring and fouling. So if you mistake causation and correlation, what you're going to do is tell your key players to go out and foul as fast as they can so they get more points. Of course, both of those are associated with a third factor, which is playing time. But it gets a little more messy because if you do even try and look at uh, what are even the important correlations or those that are significant, well, in the old days when I'd look at 20 factors maybe and try and find a couple that, that were correlated, if you use your tr traditional significance tests, you're only going to, you, you have an acceptable risk of finding totally bogus uh, factors to be significant. But if I look at 20,000 factors, Statistically, even at 99% confidence tests, I'm expecting 200 bogus effects to pop out. So I have to do even additional work now to figure out which of those are real, or more so, put some judgment on the front end around what are the factors that have any logical uh, relationship here that we are even having a relevant reason to test. And then I think you also have to get into maybe documenting the analytics, not just that you've done, but that you've chosen not to do. So if you remember, Boeing got in a lot of PR hassle over the battery uh, problem in their new airplane. And someone had asked me whether they had really messed up uh, by not finding that problem. And I said, well, that's not really a fair statement unless we had some other key facts. First of all, did they have data on those batteries? I mean, we know they had data all over the plane. We don't know what they collected on the batteries. Would it have been able to identify the problem? When they analyzed it, did they actually analyze it in the appropriate way? And it didn't show a problem, but it, the problem popped up in real life. Or another very plausible scenario was simply that they only had so much manpower and computing power to look for problems, and they had to use judgment to determine where to focus their efforts. Things like an engine absolutely can't fail. They probably analyze the heck out of those. Things like the microwave oven that the flight attendants use to heat a meal, not, you know, it's a, a little bit of a, of a hassle if it doesn't work, but there's no safety issue. They probably didn't put as much effort in there, and the batteries, if they've never had issues historically, probably fell in the middle. They may not have gotten there. But once a problem arises, of course, everyone expects that they should have obviously seen it. It's the cl classic needle in a haystack. Very hard to find, but once you see it, you're going to see it 100% of the time. It's right there in front of you. So 
one thing here is then as your organization makes the trade-offs of what will you analyze and what won't you analyze, particularly where liability could be involved, document also why you chose to do what you do and why you chose to bypass other methods so that if something like that comes up, you're able to say, hey, we thought about that battery as a potential thing. Given our prioritization, we didn't have the resources. It wasn't judged high enough risk. That's why it didn't make the cut. In the future, it's going to make the cut. Wouldn't have solved the whole problem, but it makes it a lot, uh, a lot easier. And then we get into the real power of big data. It's not about big and it's not about data. It's about information and it's about new information. And this is a really, really important point because if all big data was, was a bunch of the same old stuff we've had but with higher volume, it wouldn't be quite as exciting. So an analogy here would be back to e-commerce. When we had everyone from you know, a bank to a retailer starting to be able to mix about 10 to 15 years ago, all of their online transactions with offline transactions and do cross-channel analysis it added a ton of value. So I'm not minimizing that. But if you think about it, it's almost the exact same information. You still have, say, a deposit to an account of an amount by a person on a day. Right? Whether that happens in a branch or online, the data itself and the information is almost identical. All that's changed is the location ID or channel flag has a new value. So maybe the channel is five instead of the, the previous uh, you know, one, two, and three, and four. So while you can do some cool analytics, you really had the same information. What's different now is web browsing, for example, one of the first sources of big data to be widely leveraged. Now I not only know what somebody bought, I know all their thought process as they went through buying it. Did they look at brand primarily or did they look at features and functions primarily? Do they care about reviews or do they care about price? All of those factors are now available and that's information that we never had before Certainly not at scale. You would have had very expensive surveys or focus groups, but very, very small scale availability. That's one of the keys here is that most of these big data sources, that sensor that we talked about at Disney, uh, uh, when you get into the, the uh, fuel bands and the information they're collecting, it's stuff we just didn't have. That's where the real value is. And so as you set your strategy then, it's really key, and this is another big stumbling point that many of the large organizations that uh, we work with uh, are, are making, which is you have to have big data be another facet of your overall analytics and data strategy. You can't have a completely separate silo because here's what's going to happen. I say, hey guys, over here, and some companies have done this. They open up offices out here near Silicon Valley and staff it with people who have no experience in their business, have never been to headquarters, and they're supposed to just do stuff with big data. So with the web data example, I go and I find hey, I can, I can prove to you that I can identify everybody who's browsed and didn't buy a product today, um, and, and, and we should go send them a follow-up offer, for example. Very simplistic. The point is, I don't want to send them a follow-up offer until I match up and go, well, how valuable are they from our historical sales history? You know, what are their preferences? How much of an offer should I give them? Are they somebody who I want to give a full price offer, or do I want to give them a discount? The point is, you have to match up all kinds of other information together to get the maximum value. If you don't think that through up front, you're going to end up just where people were before the age of data warehousing, where they had a data mart here, a data mart there, a data mart there, and they started consolidating. So for years, people tried to get at least in a cohesive environment data together, and now you don't want to break that whole framework by putting big data completely separately. So this is one of the keys, and the people who got bit there again were retailers with e-commerce to have another thread. Some of the biggest retailers in the world, even today, you go to their website, it's actually not just a separate division in some cases, but a separate legal entity in some cases that set up their own supply chain and product hierarchies and everything. And now today they want to have a unified view of their business, and I can tell you they're spending many quarters, if not years, and millions and millions and millions of dollars, plus all the pain, to try and consolidate these disparate things. And it was all because of one decision made 10 to 15 years ago, which was this e-commerce thing is not a, another facet of our retail strategy. It's this whole new thing that we're going to go on a separate path. Don't make that same mistake with uh, big data. So then we get to one big issue, which is privacy. And I've touched on this once or twice. But is big data really becoming big brother? I, I, just, I saw an article even just last week where, I don't know if you're aware, but your browsers now have a little feature you can say do not track and set it as a setting. It's voluntary at this point. In other words, it's not a legal setting like the federal do not call list. It's a setting that the, that the community said, we're going to make this available, and the best practice or the supposition is that the primary uh, websites that you would deal with would obey that preference of yours that you don't want to be tracked. 
well, I think it was, it was just last week, it was Facebook now who added themselves to the list of people, oh, we're just gonna ignore that do not track thing because it's not convenience for our business, right? There's a lot of privacy issues popping up. And in my opinion, almost all of them occur from one simple premise. Whenever there's ambiguity as to what your privacy policy is, do not resolve it in your favor, resolve it in favor of the customers whose privacy is at risk. In other words, don't say we didn't really address this, so we're going to address it now saying we can do it and just announce it to everybody. That causes problems. Say we didn't address it, therefore we're going to give people the option to allow us to use the information this way moving forward if they chose. So there's really three levels you have to look at, in my opinion. What's legal, what's ethical, and what's going to be acceptable to either your customer base or just the public as a whole. And these are not in sync today at all. In fact, what's legal can often be, in the states at least, the loosest of these criteria because the laws have not really caught up. What's ethical is something you can just ask yourself. Well, what's the right thing to do here? What would I want to have happen if it was uh, me uh, at, at, at risk? And then there's even another level of what will customers accept? You can have something legal and ethical, but it will still upset your customers. So the best example of this, passing the first two and losing on the third, was Target a few years ago with that whole thing that got in the newspaper, New York Times, about uh, predicting pregnancy, and they predicted the teenage girl was pregnant, and her dad didn't know yet, and it caused a big mess, right? Perfectly legal, they had a loyalty program. Perfectly ethical, they told customers, we're going to collect your data, we're going to develop offers based on that. They were following that 100%. The catch was, it was they went and predicted something customers weren't comfortable with, and that's where they got burnt very badly. Uh, so this is the key then. I would say always go by the third. Think through, what would I think if I found out that this was happening to my data and I hadn't been aware of it? I think over time we're going to see privacy policies uh, you know, really uh, uh, start to evolve, and if they don't, we're going to end up with huge intervention. Europe is already so much more strict with data and privacy than the United States. Uh, uh, and companies can lose a lot of the ability to do the good with the data if we don't make it more clear that we're not going to do the bad with the data. And then with all of this data, one huge paradigm shift is that most of our historical data, if we collected it, it was because it was important, right? Uh, my first job at AT&T 20-some years ago, you know, it was a mainframe-based uh, uh, company at that point. We only collected the stuff we absolutely had to collect. It was so darn expensive. And so if we collected it, we probably kept it. I put in quotes forever. More or less, once you had it, you're always going to keep it. If not live for me to query today, we have it on a tape somewhere or some other backup that if we needed it, we could go get it. That's not true with big data. There's a lot of big data that just may not matter really at all. And you have to start to think, just because data exists now in, uh, somewhere, if I can't think of any plausible use for it, and it's going to start to generate terabytes or petabytes or even more over time, why am I going to collect it? So examples of ridiculously low value data. We've already got connected appliances. In fact, last year, there was the first case of spam being sent by a refrigerator over in the UK. Right? Someone hacked the refrigerator that was internet connected and had it sending spam emails. Point is, that's leading towards where you'd have a little app running that will be getting your shopping list ready because your, uh, your products will have a sensor, the, the, the refrigerator or, or the, the app will be querying, you know, are you out of date and or are you low on supply and should I add it to the shopping list? Think of all of the meaningless past the moment communications between all the items in the pantry and the refrigerator and that app that occur. And think if you were the manufacturer of the refrigerator and wanted to collect that, why would you ever do that? All that really matters is at the end, what was on the shopping, recommended on the shopping list. The updates every 10 minutes reaffirming that the ketchup hasn't been used again in the last 10 minutes is pretty pointless. At most, you might keep the changes when it says, oh, I just got squeezed and I'm down another, another half ounce. Right? Then you have data that may matter for a short period of time and then quickly becomes irrelevant. So one example here, let's say you're the military and you've got pallets of, of MREs and if you actually go look at MREs they'll, they'll, they have a chart of how long they're good uh, based on the average storage temperature. So if you're keeping them at 90 degrees they're good, I think it goes down to like just a matter of a few weeks to a month. If you keep them at like 50 degrees they'll last 7 to 10 years, something along that line. So if you've got the pallets and you've got them running through your, you know, uh, in storage and then you're shipping them and you're deploying them, you might very much care about tracking what temperature have they been at to make sure that they're going to be safe to eat. 
and you might want to keep that because if, if all of a sudden you've got a base overseas and people start getting sick out in the field, you want to be able to trace back. Well, where was the problem? Where did we miss something? But let's just say it's two months later, all the MREs from this given pallet have already been shipped, they've already been eaten because they were, they were sent out and used on a, during a mission. There's really no point to keeping indefinitely the temperature, the humidity, all this other information on all of those MRE uh, uh, boxes in the pallet. What you might do is keep a sampling of data where it was all okay, and a, then, a sam uh, then, uh, then maybe all of the exceptions where really weird things happened, like they got heated up to 95 degrees and dunked in water uh, before, before they got handed out. But the data clearly had value short term, then it's gone. One last example here would be a chunk. Let's say you have a website, you're collecting all the web browsing history, not for marketing, but for operational purposes, to keep it up and running, to look for problems. If we revamp the website, deploy it on a new platform today, why, was any, why is anyone going to care again six months from now what problem there used to be on the old platform that no longer exists that sometimes led a browser to crash? You can probably, you may have built up petabytes of historical data there. Suddenly, in one moment, as soon as we turn on the new website, it's all irrelevant and you can kill it. And then we get into data you're still going to keep for a long time. Even some of the big data, if it's health, if it's some sensor data, uh, and I'm a diabetic and I'm get, getting my blood sugar monitored, we might want to keep all of that data forever as far as I'm concerned until maybe after I die. Um, so this is one of the key things. It's no longer this binary, do I collect the data or not, and if so, I keep it forever. Now it's do I collect it or not, if I collect it, for how, how much of it do I collect, and for how long will it be relevant? And that's, a, again, a big change. Let's talk a little bit about organizing and people. So if I go back, I have a master's degree in statistics. So I'm sort of the classic quant nerd, uh, you know, used to be predictive model or data miner type. And the fact is, when I came out of school, right, we were the nerds. Okay. I've actually found that some of the younger people don't recognize this as the two stars of the movie Revenge of the Nerds. How many people know that this is Revenge of the Nerds here? Maybe two thirds at best. So. Because it's hard to see, I, I actually discovered that some young people thought that really was me on the right there. Okay? <laughs> so I just want to clarify, I don't have any shame in the fact, you know, hey, I'm a stats guy. I can't really claim to be much but a nerd by definition. No one will believe me. But I was never that nerdy to wear that pocket protector and glasses, okay? Um, point is, there was zero career path of substance for me when I came out of school. I got into it because I liked data. I liked analytics. And I was going to be the guy in the basement in a cube somewhere cranking out some stuff that I'd have fun doing. There was no career. There was no multi-levels of responsibility. If you were an analyst in a big company, you were pretty much an analyst. I always say that, you know, I would talk to somebody who then talked to somebody who then talked to somebody who might just make a decision. I was removed from IT. I was removed from business. We were in our own little uh, world. And that's what life of analytics people were for many, many, many years. But something's changed in recent years, and this is one thing I'm most thankful about big data for. From a career perspective, big data has taken the concept of analytics, particularly some of the new trendier terms. You know, it's not just data anymore. It's big data. That's a lot cooler. It's not analysts anymore. It's data scientists. Somehow that sounds cooler. But we've got all of these uh, very respected journals now saying not just are, are people like us maybe not too nerdy anymore, but we might be cool. We might be sexy. So you know, this is a trend you want to take advantage of now. Because you can't be the sexiest job in the world for too long, and there's not much upside, right? So who here is an analyst by profession in some way, shape, or form? Does anyone? Excellent. Okay. So here's a little exercise I always like to encourage people to do. And you'll feel a little silly, but you better do it while you can. When you're getting ready later tonight for bed and you're going to brush your teeth, stop and just look in the mirror and smile at yourself and say, I do analytics and I'm sexy. Okay? <laughs> it's about the first time. And it could be the last that others would agree and you wouldn't be just making a fool of yourself in front of your mirror at night, right? So there are some challenges, though. When I came out of school, most analytics at, at, or at large companies, there's always exceptions. But for the most part, it fell into what I'm going to broadly say the disciplines of statistics or forecasting. By that, I mean we were doing your classic t-test for marketing campaigns or maybe a regression to predict churn uh, or forecasting. What's the sales next month, quarter, year, et cetera? You could hire a person with a degree, and they could probably cover all of your analytics. And when I used to hire, it was all about, are they an analytical person? And if they had good experience, I'd hire them, and I would have confidence they could handle pretty much everything we had to throw at them because it was, it was a, a pretty narrow focus. Part of the big data challenge, though, is about new data sources that have a different fundamental 
uh, not just a different fundamental structure in all cases, but a different fundamental relationship between the data within that structure that requires new analysis methodologies. So graph analysis has been around for decades, right? We could probably find a paper in the 30s or 40s that would define all of the metrics anybody uses for graph analysis today. But organizations didn't have the data nor the processing power to actually put those algorithms to use until recently, and now they're becoming increasingly important. Text analytics, again, it's not a rocket science compared to statistics or e economics uh, or anything else, but it's different, right? You have different algorithms, different approaches, and, uh, and, and typically some uh, different software interfaces. And then geospatial, which nobody outside of, say, a, a, a logistics company would have cared about 10 years ago. Now everybody's putting little geospatial functions on their websites and their, their applications. So the point here is it's a big challenge now because the chance of finding someone and this is by far not a complete list, right? Someone who actually knows all of these is an expert in all of these is virtually impossible. Or certainly to the extent it's possible, you'll pay even more than you need to and search even longer for them. So it necessitates changing even our hiring strategy. Instead of just looking for an individual, now I build out the team as a whole. Think of it as a pie with all the different analytic disciplines that you need to cover today. You've got one person who has some of them, Another person has some more of them. Together, if you have a project, you've got a team that in total can cover all of your needs. You have to start hiring differently now and then focusing your hires as I've done in the past where suddenly there's a new pie. We have a need for text analysis now. We never had it before. We'd better hire a person specifically who has that background. We know they'll have other things too. That'll be the gravy, but we got to cover that pie slice. This is a huge shift in terms of how people are now uh, doing their, uh, their hiring and it's something you need to be aware of because this is one of the, I, again, a, a challenge. Not only do you now have to have maybe some text and some graph and some other things, but you also have to start to combine all of them together and let them leverage off each other. It just makes it more complicated. And then we get into one question which people ask me, well, should we just outsource all this? You know, our core competency isn't analytics. And here's my view on it. You could... In the short term, of course, outsource all of it, including the strategy initially to get started if your company's not very good. But in the long run, I think it's critical that you own the design and strategy of your analytics, even if you outsource the execution. And the analogy here would be if you're building a house on a vacant lot, you're going to care very much about the blueprint and the plans and what cabinets are going in and exactly how the rooms are laid out. That's the strategy and design. Once that's laid out, you don't as much care which tile person comes in to lay the tiles and which wallboard person puts up the wallboard. As long as they're reasonably competent and experienced, they'll be able to do the execution of that plan. That's how I think you should uh, look at analytics. And over time, you need to evolve if analytics is going to be a core competency to have people owning the core competency of what's happening. And when you outsource all of it, what you end up with is you, your organization doesn't really understand it. It's the classic, you're being fed fish rather than being taught how to fish. Your relationship with that company has to be severed for some reason, and you have no knowledge of what they're doing. They own the IP and you're back to square zero. So then we get into organizing. So for one example here would be, what does an organization look like for analytics? And the answer is, well, it could look like anything today, right? It's a new discipline that's just reaching critical mass. So the good news here is, while there is no standard structure, in the last year to two years, the conversations I've had with large companies have totally shifted from Basically, for many years it was, should I be hiring some analytic people and should I add a few more? It was about an individual level of a few people. Now they all want to talk about how do I organize what I have and expand it. So two important things have happened. Companies now have enough analytic people that they have to worry about how to organize them, which is a very good thing, and they plan to keep them around or they wouldn't be worried about it, which is a very good thing. That's what uh, is going to keep all of us in the room having some job stability. But the fact is, it will over time mature. So if we go to any company of any size and go to HR, they're going to have an HR VP. Under that, there'll be director of benefits, director of recruiting, and so forth. It's pretty darn standardized with small adjustments. Same with the CFO. Analytics today, you can go. They might be under the CIO, might be under the CFO, might be under the COO, might be under strategy. I've literally seen virtually everything, and there is not quite yet that standardization. In time, I believe there will be. And at the International Institute for Analytics, we've done a lot of work on this. I know uh, my colleague uh, Tom Davenport and I both agree that this, what we call center of excellence or a hybrid model, uh, is uh, probably the best way to go. This would be where you have some component of a centralized team 
with some component of embedded teams within a business unit or a brand or a function, again, depending on your specific business. There's a lot of pros and cons. I could talk for an hour on just this topic. But I want to point out one specific reason that people don't often think about why you need at least some centralized component to your analytics and not have them distributed. And it comes down to corporate strategic initiatives around analytics. Let's take an easy case. If you're a hotel chain with four or five or six brands, most of those brands, they're only going to, well, all the brands are only going to care about analytics within their brand. That's their mission. That's their charter. But somebody at headquarters cares about cross-brand analysis and trends. Similarly, every individual uh, brand will only fund analytics that will pay out for their brand. So there could be an analysis that would take, say, this much to build and only return that much. No individual brand will actually create it. But what if a centralized team had the ability to create that analysis at that cost and then deploy it six times? Huge payout for the company. So you've got to think of it sort of like a house versus a condo. It's just a different funding model. In a house, I would fund a, a house on a vacant lot all myself with a mortgage. I would get all the benefit on the back end by moving in and enjoying that property. The corporate team, it's more like the con condominium model. No one in their right mind goes and builds a high-rise condominium because they want a condo and they figure they'll sell the other 99 units once they're done. You get, you know, you get a, a conglomerate of investors that build that at great expense and then they sell off the individual units and they make money in total but the units themselves are more affordable for every individual tenant. It's funded differently. It's structured differently. At the end of the day, they both provide housing. It's the same thing. A corporate group has the ability then to take care of analytics that the individual units could not, that oftentimes has immense strategic value. Okay. So one last thought then, before I move into the last section is, do you need something, a chief analytics officer? And I don't want to get too hung up on semantics. Maybe it's not a chief analytics officer. Maybe it's a VP of analytics. It all depends on the company. The key is do you need somebody who owns analytics clearly for the organization? So here, here's another survey question that I wish I, I could, ha could have asked everybody before you came in, which is I'd ask you write down who is the end person responsible for HR in your organization or who is the end person responsible for the financials that get reported to Wall Street. All of you would write down the head of HR, the CFO. Then I ask Who's responsible at the end of the day for any analytics that happen in your company? A lot of people would either have a question mark or they would say there is nobody or they would leave it blank. And the rest, even within the same company, might even have differing answers based on where they happen to sit in the organization. And that's a bad thing. How can analytics with big data, small data, or any other data rise to the level of a true component of the business when people aren't even aware of who actually owns that function and who actually has the end responsibility, not just for what happens, but for the politicking and the selling to upper management about the priorities. And then there's another related job called a chief data officer that's come up a lot. And a lot of people confuse these two, and I think they're absolutely different. In fact, I gave a webinar to one of the large, uh, largest recruiting companies of, a few months back to their team that focuses on analytics and big data. And we actually had a good conversation on this because I told them, I said, you sent me some background information, some job openings you're currently doing so I get a feel for how you're positioning things. And I said, you have intermixed these two. And they agreed. A chief data officer to me would probably report to the CIO. And that's about what data must we acquire? How will we acquire it? In what way will we store it and house it and uh, cost effectively make it available for analysis? A chief analytics officer would pick up from there, probably reporting to the business now, who would say, given that this data is now made available, what analytics will we do? What are the standards we'll follow? How will we measure the success? How will we prioritize it? These two roles are obviously going to have a tight linkage, but they're different. And even if you start with one person filling both, if, especially if you're a mid-sized company, you just have to understand that there's two roles being filled by one person. It's not all the same thing. You need both ends of that spectrum. So I want to finish out with a few thoughts on, on uh, putting big data to work. So the first is you have to start doing analytics in two ways. Most analytics have been confirmed, what I'll call confirmatory in the past. Very well-defined problem. We can tightly scope our effort and what it's going to cost us and our probability of success before we even start. This is how corporate projects are typically funded. Hey, Bill, we'd like you to take these specific fields from our web logs and identify if it will increase the lift in our marketing models. I can pretty much lay out for you how long will it take me to get the data, to clean it up, to create these metrics, test it in a model, and we'll measure it whether the lift is improved or not. Very safe, but also going to be very incremental in value. What you also have to do is not mindless hacking, but what I call discovery analytics. This would be 
Let's look for some anal uh, at some problems that are much more broad. For example, Bill, here's this new web data that we have. Figure out if there's anything we can do with it to improve our churn and marketing models. I still have a business goal, but you've left open to me what fields will I use, what metrics will I create, what model methodologies will I utilize. So I can't tell you exactly how long it'll take yet. I can't tell you exactly how we'll measure it yet because I haven't completed it. And what you have to start to think about now is funding a little bit differently. Instead of funding project by project, you'll never get a, a, a discovery analysis that's targeted at doing something innovative approved, or it'll be very difficult. So you have to move to portfolio funding versus project funding. And this is very much like venture capitalists do. They know that six, seven, eight out of 10 of their investments are gonna get a zero return. They're gonna lose all their money, but the few winners will make up for it. Same thing here. What you're saying is, okay, Bill, we've got these 10 ideas and we're confident some of them are gonna work, but we don't know yet which. We're gonna let you try all 10 and we're gonna judge your success based on when all 10 are done, maybe it's three, six months down the road, we're gonna decide whether you paid off the portfolio of our investment. And that sounds like a small change, but it can be a massive change. And, and it, it's compelling in the same way of, in baseball, even the best players in the world bat, you know, not quite a third of the time, more or less, they're gonna miss. Nobody, no coach says, we're in the bottom of the ninth, we're down by a run, you have to commit to me, you're gonna get a hit at this bat or I'm firing you. Because they know that chance of that one occasion, even for the best, is one in three. They say, you miss today, I don't want to see a pattern of you missing again and again and again and having your average drop, but we don't worry about a single at bat. That's how you succeed with big data. As you start to explore the new information and how it applies, there will be more risk and more unknowns and you just have to account for that as you lay out your project. And then you've got to follow through. There's marketing and PR involved. This has nothing to do with the analytics directly and technical people really have an issue with this at first. And early in my career I did as well. But you've got to sell this. Just finding a billion dollar opportunity and dropping it on a CEO's desk hasn't achieved anything. You've got to convince the CEO and, and anyone else who has a stake in this, well, why does this matter? Why is it a good thing? How will this make the business better? And it's not all just about the numbers, it's about the, you know, the concepts behind those numbers. That can go external as well. A lot of these uh, uh, online companies, their recommendation engines or other features are analytic based products. They'll go and tell you about it. Hey, come back to our site. Look at this wonderful new feature we put we think that you'll enjoy. They let the general public understand when they've upgraded their analytics. You then have to think through the support as you start to deploy these analytics more broadly, right? Well, who's gonna use it? And then what happens if there's a question? What about when the call center uh, people uh, are, are struggling with how to understand what they're supposed to say for these things? Part of that certainly is a matter of the people who are scripting it, but for them to do the right script, you have to have somebody available to work with the people who are doing the script to make sure that the script actually represents the substance of what the analytics are recommending. And then the least favorite part of every analytic professional's job is this last part, which is having to actually see through the deployment into a production environment, right? You can't have a great discovery and then run away to go do the next great discovery, as much as we all would love to do that. At the end of the day, if we don't make sure it gets implemented and implemented correctly, it will fail. And so this is one of these things, it's, it's not the most fun part of the job, but in many ways, it's the most critical part of all of our job is making sure that we see that through, particularly because we'll be dependent on our IT infrastructure and so forth in many cases to do this. And the people who own that infrastructure aren't analytical. They're gonna need someone who understands analytics involvement to make it work. And so then two last things for you is, the first is you, you can start small. A lot of people get too hung up, and I think it's the semantics. Big data, it sounds huge, it sounds massive. You read in, the, in, in journals and so forth, all of these huge projects that companies have done. And so you start to think, well, we've gotta go big too. We've gotta do a massive project. And the answer is you don't necessarily have to do that, at least not at first. And let me give you uh, an example here, a real example. There was a, uh, a customer in Europe who wanted to have their web data integrated for their marketing campaigns a few years back. It was a couple million dollar effort. It was around 2009 or 10 when budgets were incredibly tight. They couldn't get it approved. Nobody doubted that it would probably work well. They knew other companies had succeeded with it. The challenge was they didn't know in their environment what it would do. It just felt a little too risky. So what the team did, they did something very smart. They realized, you know, just because we have all of this available doesn't mean we have to do it all at one time. We can take some sips. And what I mean by that is you don't need, as they had proposed, all of the web data for all of their sites, they had multiple sites, for an entire year in order to then start figuring out what value it had. In other words, you don't have to invest the millions to then figure out if there's value in it. 
they got very smart. They said, we're going to go out to one of our websites, two of our key product lines, capture the web data and only part of the web log data for just the people who browse those specific subsets of product lines. That shrunk the amount of data down so small they could easily fit it into their current systems, uh, analyze it with their current tool sets, and they just had to invest some people time. They were able to do these simple tests like someone browsed and didn't buy, we'll send a follow-up email, for example, and show the lift. A couple of easy case studies like that, they got an 800% return on their pilot in five months. Now imagine the conversation when they went back to management. They said, wow, look at this, guys. We just uh, did this experiment with just a, a little bit of t people investment time. Look at this return. By the way, that was a few product lines on a few on one website. If we extrapolate that over an entire year to all of our properties, it's this huge number. Everyone's eyes light up. By the way, this is a floor, not even an expected value, certainly not a ceiling, because we only did some very simplistic things to prove it. We have all these other ideas of how to more deeply leverage this information once it was available. And they got their approval. So imagine that conversation now. Those senior management now approves that project, excited about funding what's truly a worthwhile investment that they all know the return's coming. And they're excited to shovel the money out versus initially when you're making a too big of an investment up front with, a, with an unknown gain on the back end, it seems very risky and people feel like their job is at stake. So just because it's big data, think about how much of it do you have to have to prove that it's worth the big investment. Then you do the big investment rather than saying, let's go do a big investment as a way to prove what it's worth. And so one last thought then is that we're going to have to move from IT serving to enabling. An analogy here would be, I had a yo and this is true, I had a yogurt shop, frozen yogurt shop, two miles from my house until about two years ago. And it was what I'll call the old style yogurt shop. You'd walk in and you'd say you want a medium, the person will meter it, they'll hand you your cup, and then they'll say, oh, do you want any of these toppings? And if you say yes, you know, they'll put some sprinkles on. Maybe it's three fifty for the yogurt and 89 cents a topping. So I used to not go very often because they didn't have a lot of flavors, but on top of that, I found it a little offensive to pay 89 cents for a small spoonful of sprinkles on top of a base price of 350. Right? And I certainly wouldn't buy two or three toppings. So I'd often even get none just sort of doing my own silent protest. I didn't have a very good experience. Right? I'm cheap, I admit it, can't help it. I didn't go there very often. Two years ago, within three months of each other, within a quarter mile of that original shop, three of these new style yogurt shops opened up and within six months the original one was out of business. These new shops have a wall of yogurt, you're probably familiar with these, you go get any flavor, any kind you want, you get this massive topping bar, you put anything you want, you prepare it, you pay by the ounce instead of they prepare it and you pay by the cup and topping. Massively better experience here. I go there though and I start adding this flavor and that flavor. I start adding all these toppings. I had the fruit and the gummy bears and these little mochi from Japan. If you've never had them, try them. They're very good. Um, and I weigh that thing. Do you know how much I end up paying every day on time? Six fifty or seven dollars, right? Every time. But I love it because I got exactly what I wanted. Okay? That small shift. Server prepare, pay by cup and topping, you prepare, pay by the ounce. Totally changed the environment. And from a cost model, these businesses are almost 100% identical. In fact, the new ones, you could argue, have more. They have more machines and more toppings. Let's just say it was even on the infrastructure, the machines and such. Same cash register, same cashier, same cup and spoon for every bowl, etc. Cost is almost identical, yet the model on the right, with that small shift, gets more visits from me with a higher average transaction from me, and I'm more satisfied. That's the holy grail in any kind of business, right? If you were an old school yogurt shop, to go to the new school one, you don't have to rip and replace everything. All you do, you move your register out of the way of the machines and you move the shield off of the toppings and you let people have it and you put it in the scale. You could shift from one mile to the other very cheaply. How this relates to our topic today is, think about yogurt as data. Most IT shops traditionally decide what data you can have and they meter it to you in their ways that they've predetermined. When we say enabling, it's not about ripping and replacing your infrastructure and having to buy all new technology, it's about using the technology in a slightly different fashion so that the end users and analytical professionals have the ability to mix and match data more freely. Because we can't think up all of the questions. Think of the to tools as toppings, I'm sorry, toppings as tools. You can have as many tools as you want. It's very hard and difficult in most organizations. When I'm exploring data, I should have more freedom to experiment with tools. When I find something really valuable, we can have a conversation whether we want that tool that I used to be in a production environment or not. But at least we'll have that conversation knowing it's worth putting in production and knowing we have to find a way to do it. Then I'm okay with it. It's about discovering things as rapidly as you can.
So I think this is a, 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 a key thing. Think about how to shift your model. And at the end of the day then, just to close out, right? big data is not getting any smaller. The video game industry struggles today with what they call telemetry, which is every button press and controller move and tracking how players game. We already have motion controlled videos. Now you have every body part, 3D space, every millisecond direction and velocity. Whole nother layer of big. Surfing the web, that's click by click underneath purchase, thousands of clicks per purchase. Well, you start to have uh, uh, the ability to track eye movement or, uh, or even today it already exists. Pixel by pixel, where's the mouse pointing by millisecond? Whole nother level of big. This health data we're collecting, they're already overwhelmed with the electronic medical records and the digitization of x-rays and MRIs and everything else. Now I'm collecting gosh knows how much on myself over time. It's going to be huge. So you can't sit back and think, well, that's okay. We'll wait for others to solve this for our industry, then we'll pile on because there's going to be a new layer to have to pile on top of that. And if you're that far behind, it's going to be very hard to catch up. So with that, I'll just uh, give you my contact information if you have questions later. Um, some of this content was from my book, Taming the Big Data Tidal Wave, from about two years ago. And I've got another one uh, coming out this fall called The Analyst Revolution. I'll be around, like they mentioned, at the uh, break and lunch and so forth if you have other questions. And I thank you all for coming today.